What is up, Wrestling Card fans? Welcome to Husker Have Wrestling Card Podcast. My name's Mike. I'm from Mike's Retro Trading Cards, and I'm joined by old Husker Have himself. How you doing today, Anthony? Good. How's everyone doing? Doing good. Our guest today is a blogger, a podcaster, a dealer, a collector. He's the Wax Pack Hero. He is Mike Summer. How you doing today, Mike? I am doing great. Uh, it's, it's always a good time when you get a chance to talk a little bit about wrestling cards and collecting in general. It's <laughs> it's going to be a good time. Great. Yeah, I, I I just want to say from my perspective, um, you know, over the last couple of years, we've seen a, a lot of negative in the hobby, and you are one of the most positive that there is. And I'm very appreciative that you came on our podcast to uh, hang out with us this afternoon. So, well, uh, welcome. Thank you. I appreciate that. I try to be positive. There's there's times where I definitely can get a little cranky from time to time, and <laughs> Uh, something rubs me the wrong way, but I do my best to be positive. So thanks. I appreciate that. I think yeah, I so, saw a little bit of that on Twitter this week myself. So <laughs> I saw a little bit well, of that exchange, but. Well, well, the, the interesting thing, because, you know, the, the, this, this series podcast is kind of just, I want to bring you on because you're kind of like me uh, a, a lot in regards to finding good deals, knowing how to hunt, and uh and just collecting in general what i call the art of collecting first and foremost i want to congratulate you because you pulled up probably one of the best finds that i've seen probably in the last 10 or 15 years and i'm not i'm not just saying that to blow smoke i mean that in all sincerity you got six of the 1985 tops uh wwf 3d cards can you tell us how you manage that and uh and uh and how that whole thing went down for you because i think people would really like to hear that because i'm yeah. amazed by it myself go ahead mike yeah it was so that was one of those issues or one of those releases that i had been after one of my favorite things to collect about wrestling cards is some of the limited more hard to find food yep. issues from the 80s yep. and these 3d cards were one that that had piqued my interest when i learned about them I had come across some of the baseball versions of those over the years. And when yeah. I learned that there was some some wrestling ones with some of my favorite wrestlers from that era and that they were fairly limited and scarce and hard to find, I was like, well, I, I need to try to find and track some of these down. And so I would scour your site. I would check eBay regularly. I would check ComC and, and Sport Lots as well for some of these types of things. And eventually I had put an alert on eBay and a safe okay. search and this was one of those where that paid off and it, that alert hit probably maybe quicker than, than anybody else before they <laughs> saw it but it was an ebay listing that somebody had put up for six of them and um i i went out and snagged it actually i i made an offer i took a chance and made an offer <laughs> and they accepted the <laughs> offer within five minutes and oh, wow. and i went ahead and and grabbed six of those but you know, up to that point, you'd see one or two trickle out, yep, you know, yep, and they're yep. the Hogan and the Andre the Giant are super, super expensive. The ones that I typically would see had already been graded um, by Beckett for sure. And I, I don't know if PSA grades those or not, but they're in a super jumbo sized, you know, uh, card holder because they're, they're a non standard size card. Um, but you rarely did I ever see, I don't know that I ever had seen any, any raw ones or ungraded copies out there. So yeah, I was thrilled to be able to snag six of them all at once. And they even had the, the wrapper, the, the pack yep. that they came in too. So six of them loose with the wrapper, um, got them all in, in one fell swoop there. And so yes, half the set down, six more to go. We'll see if I can ever find those. I was going to ask you if you had any uh, that you hadn't had listed I, yet. I have, I have six in my own collection. And I'm looking for six also. You know, the interesting <laughs> thing about these cards is um, a lot of people might not realize it, but as a kid, I remember actually going to a card shop and buying the baseball version because the baseball were released nationally. And uh, yeah, there's the Iron Sheik. Yeah, go ahead and pull, pull, pull up, put up some of those so people can see while I'm talking. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, um, so the baseball were, were released nationally. I think they were done in two sets, 85 and 86. And if I'm not mistaken, I think they're around 36 or 48 total cards in general. But the wrestling was only done in a test print or test version. And I don't even know if they really knew much about um, how many were really released as far as the test is concerned. 
I'm not I'm not aware of any numbers. I'm not aware of anyone who really knows any of the numbers. Um, but I do know as as far back as three or four years ago, there was an individual in Indiana who had an unopened box that uh, he was selling that he was asking, you know, a little bit more than I would be able to pay for. But uh, they are very rare, very hard to find. And uh, man, you 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 hit a home run. I got to ask you, um, you don't have to say yes or no, because I guess anyone can kind of go on eBay and dig and look. But your offer was it? over or under a thousand oh yeah so they it, i mean it's out on ebay it's in the sold listings they they had listed it at 600 for the six and i offered 500 and they Un- amazing that. so amazing. i got them for you know 90 something a piece shipped with tax and shipping and everything so yeah that's amazing i i, I am i am so impressed so blown away that and you know but but i guess that goes into what we're talking about on this podcast today and and that is the art of collecting i mean that was something that you did that you took the time to look for and hunt and um when it comes to collecting that's something that to me is almost like an art and uh explain why don't you go ahead and explain a little bit about some of the things that you do to hunt down cards especially your older wrestling, the, the, the places you go on the websites. Cause I'd like to share some of the things that I do to kind of help people out when they're looking for stuff. So go ahead. Yeah. So I, m- one of the primary ways that I love to collect is in this, this idea of having a self-sustaining hobby and that I want my collection to pay for itself. Yep. And so that's why I buy and sell cards to make a little profit. And then I use that profit to buy the cards that I want to keep for my myself. Now, sometimes it's using the profits and buying a card or a collection or a lot directly like I just did with with these um, 85 3Ds. But sometimes it's it's kind of building it up over time. And I'll use the cards from some of these big bulk purchases that I make when I buy an entire collection or I've, I've bought a guy's entire attic before. Right. And yep. there's going to be all kinds of stuff that you get with that. And some of it I will use as inventory to sell. And then some of it will be things that I add to my collection. Um, I love collecting vintage baseball sets as well. And so every time I get a, a collection that has vintage baseball, I'll check my starter set checklist and see, okay, I need these 10 or 15 cards. I'm going to add them into the PC and then I'm going to sell off the rest. And so as I am treasure hunting these big collections, I'll be able to slowly add things onto that as you know, and, and kind of keep building up the PC over time through these big collection purchases. And I do the same thing with the wrestling card purchases as well. And so I will, you know, look for specific lots of wrestling that are out there. Somebody has listed on, you know, online platforms or, or on eBay or Craigslist, you know, Facebook marketplace, and, and I'll try to see what they've got. Um, I'll put the word out, you know, I think relationships is key too. So I'll put yep. the word out with, other local people, um, other collectors that I know. The wrestling card community is great. Um, And I'll put the word out, hey, I'm looking for this. If you come across this at a show, in a collection that you find, um, let me know. These are some things that I'm I'm looking for that I'm trying to track down. So I utilize kind of a network of of fellow collectors also to do that. Um, And then I'll sometimes put the word out on my own podcast. So these are some of the things I'm interested. These are the things I'm I'm trying to collect. And that's actually how I was able to make a connection with a collector that lives up in Canada who heard me talking about some of the cards I was looking for. And he hooked me up with with the sets of the Quaker Dips cards that I have that are also very tough to find that were a Canadian release. He's hooked me up with some Stewart's. Cards from up there that that are hard to find Um, some of the Opeachy sets. Um, the 85 OPG uh, sets that are n- not as easy to find here, but they're a little more available than some of the other things. But through talking about it on the podcast, he knew that those were things I was interested in. And he reached out via email and he's now keeping an eye out for me up there for some things that that come up that he's able to find a little more easily. So networking is huge. Putting save searches out there is huge. Um, and then just kind of turning over corners, doing Google searches, you know, doing searches within Facebook, you know, just to see if somebody has posted that. Um, I, at one point I found some of the Norman Smiley, uh, one of one of one cards that I was looking for by doing a search within the blowout forums. And I found somebody who broke a case of uh, one of those products back in like 
2016 or 2017 pulled a, a Norman Smiley and I reached out to him and said, I know it's a long shot that you still have this, but do you? And he's like, no, I don't have it anymore, but I know who I sold it to. Here's <laughs> his name. And so then I went to Facebook and tracked that guy down on Facebook and reached out to him. He's like, yeah, actually, I think I do have that somewhere and ended up getting like five one of ones of Norman Smiley nice. through doing one one step after another kind of tracking that that down running down different leads and so it takes some work sometimes to uncover some of these gems that that you're looking for yeah it is a lot of work i mean it is the, i mean work in quotation marks but you know you have to spend a lot of time when you're looking for this stuff especially you know i collect paul Heyman cards so you know yeah some of the newer stuff is a little easier to find but like the older stuff it's difficult. Like I was looking for the 92 uh, UK tops card for quite a while. And I ended up actually buying a box because I couldn't find any on eBay. And then, you know, there were a couple listed after I bought the box and ripped it, but still that was fun. But I mean, you have to invest a lot of time into this. If you want to be able to find the stuff, the harder stuff that you're looking for, it just doesn't show up all the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, it, you gotta, you gotta keep looking and you gotta be patient. You know, I think I'd had that alert set for these 85 3ds for two years. Right. <laughs> and then the right place, right time. I happened to be available, you know, at the computer when I, when the alert came through and I uh, was able to jump on it. So yeah, you, sometimes it's a little bit of luck, but it's a lot of, a lot of effort as well. Yeah. The, the, the effort I think really transpires into luck because I'll, I'll be honest with you. If I would have found those, I would have sniped those in a heartbeat. <laughs> Cause I know, I know uh, there was one time I was on eBay and something popped up that I didn't think I'd ever see. And that was the hurricane mask. And, uh, and I worked out a deal with a guy to get that. And um, it's just one of those things, you know, you, you have to be kind of vigilant. I mean, I, I, I know one of the things that has helped my store and, and to be honest with you, your, your theory of self sustained hobby is exactly the reason that I started my store. When I did, it was something along the lines of, I was having all this extra inventory. Um, why let it just sit down here? Maybe someone else can use it. And so I would put it on there to make some money to be able to buy more stuff without having to take out any money out of my family's budget and that kind of thing. So I think it's great that you're doing exactly what you're doing because to me, that's, that, that's probably the best way to handle this hobby is you buy, sell and trade and you stay afloat that way instead of, you know, taking up so much debt and stuff like that through the years. Like some people that I know have done, you know, just to just collect because it's not worth it. If you're, if you're falling behind financial wise in this hobby. And I think it's cool how you go, go ahead and go about do that. Some of the places that I use that a lot of people don't necessarily maybe look at much um etsy uh macari um have you have you had any good luck with those uh mike i'm just curious because i've 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 got some good decent deals off of there and and then the other one that does really wonders um is facebook marketplace um just doing general searches for cards you'd be surprised how many times you can find someone who has a lot of football cards they're selling but then you see in the picture there's about two or 300 wrestling cards in there. So I'm just curious what you, what, what are some of your other sites that you've had good luck with? Yeah, I've not, I've not used Macari um, or Etsy for that purpose yet, but maybe I should, I'm going to, I'm going to note that down and, and start looking there. Facebook marketplace for sure. You know, I have um, every once in a while um, on Twitter, you know, somebody will post some cards on Twitter and, and some of the other social media stuff like that. Um, I don't think I've ever, I know people sell cards all the time on Instagram, but I don't think I've ever bought anything from a kind of an Instagram deal, but, but Twitter for sure. Um, but other than that, it's, it's kind of the, the local stuff, you know, in the past I've, you know, there's our local area. Sometimes there'll be local classified ads and things like that, that are, that are out there that I, I will search for, or I'll put a want ad out there in a kind of a local classified type of deal and say, Hey, I'm, uh, looking to buy clean. If you're cleaning out your closet and you've got a bunch of cards you don't want, you know, let me know and we see if we can work something out. So I've, I've kind of proactively put one tads out kind of in local marketplaces as well to kind of um, search for those types of things. And then there's a few um, 
dealers in our general area in central Illinois that I've been able to um, kind of approach and kind of work out deals sometimes. You know, I focus primarily on low to mid end cards, right? And there's sometimes mm -hmm. there are show dealers or there are other dealers who they don't even want to mess with that stuff. They just want right. to look at right. mid and high end. And I've been able to work out again, it goes back to relationship building situations where if as they get in collections and they focus on the high end stuff, they set aside all of the low to mid end stuff. And then eventually every so often we'll work out a big deal where I scoop up all of that at a great price. And but they're able to still make their customer happy by buying and taking all of this stuff off their hands or whatever. So you know, I, I've utilized that as an approach to source some inventory as well. Yeah, yeah you I think and I idea. live. You and I live in the same space there with that too, because I do the same thing. And like, I was just at a the one local card shop, like in the town that I work in. I actually have been digging through the cards there, even their back room. <laughs> they have a back room, and the guy who works there and the guy who owns it has separate piles in the back room. So. Over the course of probably four months or so, I was stopping over there once a week and spending two or three hours digging through cards. And I mean, he was happy to sell the stuff to me. Like he gave me great prices on it. Like, it, like he said, this is stuff that has been sitting here forever that I'm probably never going to move. So if you can do something with it, I'm more than happy to give you a deal. And, yeah. you know, like building that relationship is a big thing. I was at another card shop that I go to quite a bit recently and kind of just threw out the red herring to the owner of that shop too. Cause I, I mean, I was talking about Chipper Jones. I run a lot of stack sales on Twitter and I sell Chipper Jones like crazy. I live in central Pennsylvania. Nobody around here ever sells Chipper Jones cards. Like everybody I talk to that sells cards, they're like, I can't tell you the last time I sold Chipper Jones. I'm like, well, I will buy them from you because I can. And that dealer was, saying the same thing he didn't know when so i know he has a lot of collections i kind of planted the seed hopefully that maybe he'll consider selling me some of his leftover stuff because i'll take leftover stuff i'm sure they're the same way like not leftover to me but you know stuff you can go to and definitely def definitely use it when you go through it yeah absolutely i think you know sometimes we can get in our own silos and we we know what we like we know what um, a certain segment likes, but there is one of the things I've learned over these last several years is there is a collector for pretty much any type mm -hmm. of card, you know, totally. whether totally you're agree. talking sports, non-sports, wrestling, modern, vintage, commons up to, you know, the, the high end six figure type cards. There are cards out there and a collector for all of them mm -hmm. and, it, and a big piece of me having that self-sustaining hobby is I I've gotten, I feel like I've gotten pretty good at being able to find the right marketplace for the right cards to make those two things match up and, and have those cards that those collectors are looking for in the right marketplace to be able to, to be able to sell those and, and make some money on them to then be able to, to buy those other cards that I want to keep. And now it's Mike, great too, I, to be able to like, I I'm sure you kind of feel the same way. I, I, I think people sometimes think I'm a little crazy when I say this, but I like I like getting those cards from the dealer and then getting them to people who can appreciate them. Like, yes, I'm making some money on it, but like I do like appreciate being able to help out other collectors. Like, you know, every single Chipper Jones that I dug out of those boxes that have been sitting there for 15, 20 years are now going to new homes when I run a stack sale and people are happy to have those cards. And I like that. Like, I feel like kind of keeping the hobby moving, so to speak, by finding that stuff that is just tucked away that, you know, like you said, you know that people want to buy, but you're digging through and you're spending the time to find it for them. Yeah, a lot of the stuff that I sell, you know, isn't the glamour type cards, right? But mm -hmm. um and that type of stuff, you know, set builders and people going after, you know, a player collection that has a bunch of 25 cent cards in it, you know that type of stuff doesn't get near the the glamour you know on social oh, yeah. media that's not the stuff that gets highlighted and so when i can kind of help meet those needs and they get super excited about being able to buy 25 or 30 or 50 jose canseco cards or whatever it is when they mm -hmm. come into the shop for five bucks or whatever we end up landing on you know that type of stuff is so much fun because 
they don't ever get that recognition or feel maybe as supported mm -hmm. with their type of collecting. Um, that, that's just not what you see all the time. And there's another part for me that's that gets a lot of personal satisfaction about taking these these bulk collections that many people would view as worthless mm -hmm. and turning them into something that is significant. So yeah. really kind of turning what other people's trash into, into treasure yeah, and both absolutely. treasure for the collectors who are able to, to pick up these cards, but also treasure for me in the form of both profit as well as is PC cards on down the road. Yeah. yeah I think it's, I think that's very interesting because I know, uh, two weekends ago, I was down at the Kansas City Card Show, and um, you know you have guys that have tables that are nothing but graded. Cheapest card on there is like fifteen hundred dollars a piece, and you got people walking and walking. And I have one whole table set up of uh, three tables that are nothing but quarter and dollar boxes, and I've got guys sitting in chairs going through that stuff with people waiting behind them to climb in to start going through that stuff. And I'm thinking as you watch that more and more, you begin to realize that people want to buy a lot of cards and this ain't just wrestling cards, but this was football and baseball and everything else that I had there. You know, by the time the uh, Saturday was over, you know, I have almost a thousand in my pocket just off a of quarter and dollar cards. And uh, these other guys are walking out complaining that, you know, well, you know, this, I, th I thought this Patrick Mahomes would sell or this, but you realize that the guys who come to the, to, to, to buy a lot, they, 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 they want to be able to get a bunch for their collection. I think that's the way we all are when it really comes to collecting is, you know, you don't, you don't want just that one card that you're going to mortgage the house for, but you want something that you're going to get a bunch that you can take home and put together in your set and your collection. And then the other thing I, I, I myself that I really get a kick out of is you, you, you buy these collections from some guys and, you know, you might sit on them for a couple of years, but the next thing you know, there's some base card uh, and, and it could be any sport um, that all of a sudden comes in demand and you paid pennies for it. And you're turning around and selling it for 10, 15, 20, $25. And you realize that, wow, you know, just my little bit of time and investment made a big difference to contributing to uh, my hobby in general. Now, here's a question I want to ask you, Mike. Um, I've seen over the last probably 10 years, maybe, and, I, and I'm, I'm curious your experience with this, maybe a lot less large quality lots of wrestling cards showing up on eBay like they used to. I, I, I years ago used to be able to buy, you know, large flat rate priority mailboxes filled with wrestling um, and stuff like that. I don't see a lot of those as much anymore. You'll see the Panini stuff, maybe not that big of a lot, but those bigger lots with those older cards like the Flair, comic images, and that kind of stuff. I don't see those a lot anymore. What's been your experience with that? And is it possible that a lot of that material, even though is made in a decent quantity, is kind of drying up? Yeah, I think there's a, a combination of some of it drying up. I think there's also the fact that, that there are more wrestling card collectors now probably than there were, you know, five or six years ago when some of that was, stuff was happening. You could say the same thing on on the blowout forums. You know, there were there was a lot more bulk collections in the buy yeah. sell trade yep. blowout yep. forums in the wrestling section too, because I just don't think there were as many eyeballs on it, right? And and there weren't as many outlets or places to sell off some of the the commons or the lesser the lesser um, desired wrestlers I, I think you just have so many more people looking and snapping those things up every once in a while i'll still find one um but but it's oftentimes similar to what you were describing before where there's somebody lists a lot of cards or a couple binders you know and they say sports card binders or they say baseball or basketball card binders, but one of them or half of the binder is, is wrestling. And unless you look through all of their pictures to, to see, you you don't know that from the description. You know, those are right. the types of, right. of situations where I'm still able to, to pick up some stuff every once in a while um, when it's mixed in with a, a bigger collection. But it, it's it's tough to find, or at least it's tough to find at what I think is a good price, um, the stuff that is a wrestling lot only. Now, uh, a card, which is in my holy grail because I needed to complete a set, just went on uh, eBay a week ago and sold the uh, Kurt Angle Relic All Access. I need that to complete that All Access Relic set because I have the Hurricane card. Um, but I planned on 
sniping that thing for a thousand. And then when it, it went what, for a little bit more than that, um, I'm starting to see that there's probably a lot more older, um, uh, older relics and stuff like that, that are going to become more desirable or more people are starting to, uh, catch on that. Yeah. You know, the newer relics aren't worth hardly really anything, but some of those older ones, especially the limited ones are, have you, ha have you been noticing more interest in that? And, and, and is there any out there that you're looking for your, yourself right now for your collection? Uh, from a, a relic perspective? Yeah. Yeah, I haven't noticed that a lot. I don't have a lot of those older relics from that era uh, myself right now. Um, and so I haven't really been been buying and selling many of those. I, it For me, it's just more of in general, you know, the stuff from that era is harder and harder to find. You know, um, you know, the things that over the last couple of years that I was able to pick up, like the um, Fleer Stone Cold Auto and the... Um, the rock comic images auto, you know, kind of that stuff from the, the mid to late nineties, the, as I was doing my research on those, you could see that the prices were going up, just like you're saying on the relics, the prices of all of those autos were, have been going up. Um, the WCW autos, you know, all of those things from that era that I talked to people who bought them a whole lot cheaper years and years ago. Right. And right. Those things are, are costing now. Um, from those things that I was, was buying. Yeah. You could see that the price had been escalating and I could only imagine that the same thing's been happening with those relic cards too. Um, but I personally haven't been, um, been buying or selling or, or trying to acquire too many of those relics. Have you noticed also how anything I would say around almost pre 2008 wax box, it, you almost cannot find it anymore. I don't care how hard you're looking it's like they don't even exist. Have you noticed that lately? Yeah, there is a there's a period of time when I was really getting into the buying and selling that I would pretty regularly come into, um, you know, some of those those uh, late eighty early nineties type, you know, yeah. um, wax wrestling wax as nope. well. Um, you just don't see it. You know, when I uh, four or five years ago, there was a guy in town that had a few boxes of, um, the 87 tops, uh, WWF sets that were sealed. And he was regularly finding 85 stuff that was sealed at a good price back then and opening it up. Um, but yeah, you just don't see that type of stuff near as much. And I don't know, I don't think I've in our area have ever seen kind of any of that Fleer era stuff sealed at, at this point yeah especially i mean once fleer took over too like i had a card shop back in that time i was actually a huge wrestling fan too so like it's kind of weird that i didn't open more of like the comic images stuff but like it really didn't sell that well for as like as popular as wrestling was and as many people that were watching it on tv and going to the events like collectors really didn't collect wrestling cards back then so you know when you got into the fleer like i can only imagine the print runs of that stuff like from 2002 and stuff like that are extremely low compared to anything that's put out today obviously and even probably the comic images stuff so that makes it really hard to find some of that stuff i would think yeah i, th I think you're right i think that that kind of hits on it for for whatever reason you know it I kind of equate a little bit of wrestling cards and r racing NASCAR cards kind of in a similar, in a similar bucket because of the fact that there are a ton of wrestling fans who really don't have an interest in cards for whatever mm -hmm. reason. And there's a ton of racing fans NASC that fill up those stadiums yeah. every weekend and just don't really care that much about cards. They'll buy nope. shirts nope. and nope. die casts and everything else, but yep they don't care about cards. And I think wrestling is the same way. They, they buy the merch and they buy figures and they buy shirts and, but, but cards just don't hit the same for so many of those, those wrestling fans. And I'm not sure why. Do you think I wanted to ask, ask you this? Cause I saw you had the tops living set for the wrestling on waxpackhero.com. Yep. And do you think when tops, resumes the license of that I, i'm not even sure what year do you know are you confirmed on a year of when they get that 
I'm guessing no. it'll probably be 2025 ish. Yeah, I think I think like it's 2025. But I was wondering if you anticipate that they might start that back up again. I always loved those. I mean, they had some really cool. One of my favorite cards is the Goblet Gooker. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, they just had some really cool and interesting cards, and I hope it's something that they decide to continue when they get the license back. I hope so. Yeah, I I enjoy those cards a lot. Um, you know, from a from a value perspective, the you know it's they're not all that valuable. You know, there's mm -hmm. there's a good number of them that will sell for less than than the original purchase price. There's a handful that sell for more. Um, you know, but for my own collection, like I I was I was buying I think five of every one, um, and then keeping one full set myself and selling off the other four. And, uh, you know, I, I hope they bring that back up. It's, it's, you know, stuck on about a hundred, I think right around a hundred is yeah. where it ended up getting capped off at. And there was a lot of good names that didn't make it into the, the checklist yet at this point. So if they're able to bring that back, I think that would be pretty cool. I would be surprised if they don't, yeah. um, but it would be interesting, you know, in the, when we, when we look at that set, if they do bring it back and we look at that set 10 or 15 years from now, there's going to be that one year where they made it. And then there's going to be a several year gap. Yeah. And I don't know if they would, you know, pick it right back up with the next sequential number with the same 85 design or whether they would skip ahead to maybe an 87 design since there was kind of a, a big, you know, gap in production yeah. because of the license. But I hope they do because I, I love the concept. I love that idea of, of print to order direct to the consumer um, two, two player or two wrestlers a week. You know, uh, I think I just, I like the concept a lot. I liked it with baseball. I like it with star Wars and I liked it with, with wrestling when they had it. So I hope so. Yeah. Do great. you, um, if, if, if you had your choice, I, 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 I gotta ask you this question. If you had your choice between the two companies, tops and flare, Mike, if you, if you could have one of those companies come back and just start making product again, which one would you rather have? I think for me, it would be tops because that has the most nostalgia for me um, of cards. Um, you know, those first cards that I had ever, ever gotten back in the, you know, 85 and 87. Um, you know, those are some of the, the earliest memories I have of, of having wrestling cards. Um, I was, I, I did not actually buy any of the FLIR products in pack form. Like that was the era that I was not actively collecting near as much. And so I, I don't have any personal connection to go into a store and finding those Fleer packs and, and buying them. And so for me, from a from a pure nostalgia perspective, I think it would be tops. Um, I, I like a lot of the Fleer cards that that were out there, or what they produced. I thought they were cool as I see them now and have learned about them later. Um, but I don't have that same personal connection to the, the Fleer cards. I have a weird idea. So with Tops taking over the license, I know you have like the first Bowman search on on mm -hmm. your website there. What would you think? I think it would be really cool if they made like a Bowman product for NXT. Exactly. And, and a, rook, a, rook, a rookie a, type of product. It'd be a first Bowman card when they were in NXT. And then when they got called up to the main roster, make it a rookie card like kind of incorporate all the things that like regular sports card collectors really like into the wrestling sets they do a bit with the rookie card thing but like i mean rookie card for wrestling is kind of a you know gray area for everything anyway but i, I think it would be really cool if they did a bowman set with like the they like they yep. have an organization there that they could do it what would you think of that yeah, that's a it's an interesting way to leverage that Bowman product line or the Bowman brand to mm -hmm. wrestling, which we've not really seen before, right? Yeah. But mm -hmm. but use use uh use that NXT as the Bowman as the Bowman line and then tops is kind of the the, yeah. the, the big stage or whatever you want to call <laughs> it. The yeah, that would be uh that would be a, a good way to, to leverage to leverage that Bowman name. I wish uh, I wish Tops would do another line. It's funny you mentioned that, Mike, because I've I've always thought the same way about Bowman Stadium Club. God, I wish they would do one Stadium Club issue of a wrestling product. Oh yeah, B borderless, high gloss photos, the works. Uh, I would love it. I would just love to see that feel on uh, on a wrestling card if Top ever gets that. Which what's your thought on that, Mike? Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I'm surprised that during that whole you know 2010 to 
2021 when they lost i'm surprised that none of those years did they ever do a stadium club line with with all of the different you know five or six releases four or five releases whatever it was that they were putting out every year i'm surprised they never did that they, that's never been done, right? Like there's no, never yeah, been no, a, a stadium no, club. No, the, the, the um, other the other thing that they could do, and I wish they would do it just once, is uh, an archive set like they did the NBA archive for the cards that were missing for the years that they didn't have the license. How cool it would be to have like a 60 to 75 card set that has like a 1970 version of Andre the Giant Tops card or a 76 version of Hulk Hogan, you know, when he first started wrestling back in AWA on what a version of that card would have looked like. They could do that with so many wrestlers through the years. And that set would just be phenomenal. I don't know why they don't ever look at doing something like that, because to me as a collector, you know, I collect baseball and football and everything else. And, and, and the nostalgia of the older feel, um, even like the newer stuff, the newer archives baseball, where they'll take like, four different years and they'll, you know, do the modern day players on those cards, man, I'd love to see them do something like that with archives. Like they did the NBA archives when they first got their NBA license back. Yeah. And you're, are you saying with the older wrestlers, like yes, the wrestlers yes, from that era? Yeah, that, yep. 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 I wonder if that's that, part of the issue. I don't know how the, how the licensing works for those players. Yeah, I don't know. Who, I don't know. Be, who are deceased or, you know, not part of the current, um, you know, the, the yeah, they're, probably if they aren't part of the legends deal with them, they wouldn't be able to they make them. Be able and to do they it. Probably wouldn't be able to put any others in a set with them. They could do something individually, though, like, you know, aside yeah. from that. But yep. yeah, yeah, you know, like Leaf has cool. done, you know, with some of their products where they go out and get those individual individual mm -hmm. agreements. Yeah. Speaking of Leaf, <laughs> about Brian Gray, have you found out anything more about that? Uh, no, no. I, um, you know, I've had a chance to interview Brian on the show before and talk with mm -hmm. him at, you know, the National and Industry Summit and some of the other industry events. And, um, you know, but I don't have a close enough relationship where he was willing to, you know, spill the beans <laughs> or, or give yeah. me any kind of scoop on on kind of what's going on there. But yeah, you know, with him kind of stepping down as CEO, I was interested to see um, because I don't believe as of this afternoon anyway, when we're recording that there's been an announcement on how him stepping down as CEO in changes, if it does his ownership of, yeah, of the company. That, that was and the that thing was kind I of was what I was interested about. in hearing is, is, you know, it's one thing to, to step down. It's another thing to completely sell off your stake and, and mm -hmm. be done. And so I was interested to hear kind of where that stands. Um, you know, I, I have not heard from, from anybody else or, or seen any kind of credible sources, you know, kind of, of what's next or, or, you know, if there are other shoes to drop besides the announcement of, of kind of who replaced him that came out, um, mm -hmm. yesterday, I believe, but, um, at this time, it'll be a few weeks ago, I guess, by the time this and, releases. So, yeah. And Brian, and Brian was kind of a uh, big advocate for the wrestling aspect of the cards too, was he not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he he had multiple wrestling releases over the last five, six, seven years. Now, it wasn't an annual thing or like every single year, but he had several um, wrestling related releases that he put out over the last several years. They yeah, I'm really wondering, good stuff I'm wondering some of that too. They were nice sets. The autograph checklist that they had on some of those were really strong for yep. for a product like that. That's not a licensed product. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, because he had he they actually produced a card that's another one on my holy grail list. The uh, dual autograph of the Hulks, the Hulk Hogan, and the Lou Ferrigno card. Mm -hmm. um, they, who, whoever came up with an idea like that to do a, a card, I think is that that that's that's pretty 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 amazing an idea to come up with something like that because that that card i think would be a great card to have in my collection but i don't have it at this time <laughs> <laughs> we all have a lot of cards like that that we want that we don't quite have yet tell us a little bit about you know how you got into the website the blogging the podcasting yeah so you know i collected as a kid for years and years right but then i took this big big gap kind of in my college and early career years. Um, I started to get back into cards in 2000, late 2015, early 2016. And as I was starting to get back into it, I realized that it didn't take long to realize that a lot had changed from the eighties and the nineties. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, and it, 
I kind of it kind of generated that idea of a self-sustaining hobby. I knew if I was going to collect the way that I wanted to collect and track down all of these cool cards, I was going to need to do something to offset some of the cost, right? And so I would start to buy and sell, you know, small collections to to offset some of that cost. I eventually kind of got this idea of, you know, if this if there was so much that I had to learn to get back into to get up to speed, right? There's got to be other people who are like me in similar situations. And how can I help them along with that education process so that they don't have to maybe go through as much as I did to, to figure it out? Um, at the same time, I had been listening a lot to Sports Card Radio, and they would talk a lot about creating content and the, the how evergreen content that you're creating can lead to um, an opportunity to make additional uh, money, uh, you know, from the hobby as well. And so I would, I thought about more about that and I said, well, that might be an idea both to start to make some money, but also to help educate at the same time. And that's kind of what led to me creating the blog back in 2017. And that's really what got things started. And as I would start to do more and more articles and start to engage more and more on Twitter from that, that led to the opportunity for me to come on as a guest to a few different podcasts and talk about the blog and what I had been doing there and kind of what I was hoping to accomplish with that. And I really enjoyed that process. And so I listened to podcasts all the time. I was like, well, you know, and I would listen to these other hobby podcasts and I'd be like, well, I, I would say things a little bit different, or I'm not sure yeah. that that's how I would, would approach that. Or, or my perspective is a little different. And I'm like, well, then, you know, why don't I, add on a podcast as well. And so in mm -hmm. 2019, the end of 2019, I went ahead and, and launched the podcast as well. And so that kind of added a whole nother opportunity for me to connect with other collectors and be able to um, help share some of the ideas that um, I was using to have a self-sustaining hobby. It didn't take too long before I realized I had as much fun um, or maybe even more fun having collector and company representative conversations and, and having and, and added on kind of the interview portions of those interview episodes as well. And so so now I have probably about half my episodes on the podcast are interviews with other collectors or card rep company representatives or marketplace owners or marketplace representatives and kind of try to paint that full collecting picture for people, uh, both telling telling the stories of other collectors as well as helping inform about what other companies and marketplaces and things like that are doing in the hobby. I still have the blog. I don't do that quite as often as I used to, just between the podcast, the physical shop that I opened up in 2020, um, and the and you know all of those things added together with my day job still is a lot is, of time is a big priority <laughs> yeah. in the family so i don't get as many articles published as i used to but yeah. i still usually get one or two a month up great so why don't you uh why don't you tell everyone where 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 do they find you at as far as uh um your store and uh your web pages and everything like that why don't you go ahead and let everyone know where they can find you at Sure. Yeah. So the main hub is waxpackhero.com. You can find all of the blog articles there and links to all the socials. The podcast is everywhere that podcasts can be found pretty much. If there's one out there that you use that the podcast isn't on, let me know and I'll see about getting that <laughs> added on there. Um, on Twitter, it's probably the, the most active place that I am on social media. It's at the Mike Summer and I'm waxpackhero on Instagram, TikTok and threads. Um, and yeah, my, my physical shop is kind of a shop within a shop set up in normal Illinois. And so I have the wax pack hero spot inside the collectible corner in normal Illinois. Um, I, I'm just open on the weekends, kind of a side deal for me, but the collectible corner is the main shop. And then I have dedicated space inside there. So Very the, nice. uh, get, getting back to, uh, the, the first question I asked you, the, uh, uh, 3d cards, are you going to send those in and get them graded? I'm not sure where to do that. I reached out to CGC and they don't have holders yet yeah. for them um, that, that would accommodate both the, the kind of five by seven size as well as the thickness because of that 3D. They're, you know, they're quarter inch thick or so. Um, I don't really like what I what I've seen from the Beckett slabs that you can see now because it's almost like a magazine size. Yeah, slab yeah. way too end. big. Yeah. 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 And, and I don't really <laughs> it's like it's the way oversized. That looks. Yeah. And I, I don't know if, if PSA is, is grading those or not. I don't know that I've seen any PSA graded ones. So eventually I might just because, 
you know, part of the question that I've got for folks that have the full set is how do you display it? Because I don't want to put it in pages, you know, like mm -hmm. I like things in pages, but with they're they're kind of brittle, right? So I don't want them yeah. to get smashed. Um, so at some point, I probably will get them graded when I can find a a slab that looks appealing, you know. Um, so we'll see, see. My, my my plan if I ever get that set completed is I'm 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 gonna get it professionally framed and oh, that's uh, a good idea and get it so it can hang up because to me to me it's like a it'd be a treasure to have yep. that so yeah yep so hey I just uh, um I think we're gonna wrap things up um at this time because we spent a little bit of time um but i just want to say thank you mike for coming on it, it was a pleasure having you on talking about collecting in general the art of collecting and uh really 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 nice to have you in the uh wrestling card community and uh in and just kind of doing the things that we're all doing yeah i appreciate you you asking me has been been fun to to talk like i said you know i i enjoy collecting a whole variety of things but wrestling is definitely one of them especially kind of that stuff stuff from the attitude era and back that that's kind of my sweet spot mm -hmm. from um from the the mid 80s there to the late 90s that's that was my sweet spot of of wrestling fandom and so i love tracking this kind of stuff down and and utilizing sites like like yours and com c and some of the others um to to be able to find these cards that treasure hunt is part of the fun and so um i, I love the fact that we can we can have this community inside the overall hobby and i appreciate you guys asking me to to come on and talk today Thanks a lot. We enjoyed having you and we'll see everybody next month, I guess. Take care guys.